We're going to share our screen now and we're, we're ready to go. There we go. All right. Um, I'm also going to get, make my little, uh, uh, make my little uh, spotlight. All right. Uh, as you recall, last week, um, I showed you the sign that actually, it, I didn't make the sign by any means. Um, if you are in the Jewish quarter and you go to the, uh, it's called the Herodian, uh, the Herodian qu quarter, um, you can actually um, buy tickets for that and several other places in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, and uh, when you're in the Herodian quarter, you go down the stairs and there's this sign greeting you um, on the lintel. You've descended three meters <clears throat> below the level of the present Jewish quarter. That would be about 10 feet. Uh, each, uh, each meter is uh, 39 inches. Uh, you've gone back 2,000 years in time. So therefore, even though um, certainly um, we have to say that archaeology is not that neat, that you know exactly one foot is exactly 200 years, but because there is a lot of turmoil that goes on, there is uh, you have uh, um, you have uh, uh, earthquakes that take place, uh, rubble which is in the way, but nevertheless, it's about about. Uh, 200 years for uh, every foot you go down. Now here you're looking at what is known as the North, um, it, it, I'm sorry, it's known as the West House. Um, it is uh, below the surface, current surface area. Many of you may well have been there. Um, it is remarkable in that you keep descending down step by step by step and you can visit three separate homes or quarters and in one of them, you actually see the ashes from the burning of Yerushalayim. They have it, of course, carefully protected, but it takes you literally 2,000 years yeah. at a time. Um, okay, let's... Um, I need to check Korea. Let's see, what did I do? Yeah, one second. Actually, I see the ashes. Right. Oh, I, oh I, I'm sorry. There. All right. Uh, I just want to bring us back a little bit so that we can see um, Jerusalem as it was, but I think there might be a better picture. No, there's not. Um, uh, just a reminder, this was called the Stoa. It was built by Herod on the southern wall of Harabait. Um, uh, it's believed the Sanhedrin was there, but also it was, it was a skybox for visiting dignitaries who were not Jewish. Um, here we have the Ophel. These are the steps leading up to the Ophel. Most people entered Harbite from the south. This is the south, and this is the southwest corner. Um, and if you recall, uh, we spoke last week about uh, what is called Barclays Gate, but the Mishnah refers to it as uh, Shar Kiponos, the, the gate, Kiponos Gate. Apparently, Kiponos was the man who, uh, who uh, probably uh, sponsored building of that gate. Now it's interesting that all gates, the, the Mishnayot in Masechet Midot said that the gates surrounding Harbai, these gates, this one, this one, all of them, and there were also, there was one on the, on the uh, east side, which is uh, where we call uh, right now what we call Shaharachamim. Um, each of those gates was uh, uh, tw 20 amos tall and 10 amos wide. 20 amos tall, 10 amos wide. The question is, what's an ama? There's a great deal about it. It's anywhere from 18 to 24 inches, one and a half to two feet. And um, as I've mentioned, I believe in this class, but if not, uh, it's, it, it, there's an important discovery here at Kiponos Gate, which we call Barclays Gate. Um, the, the Chazon Ish, who was certainly uh, recognized by many Jews as the Gadol Ador, as a matter of fact, many of them, uh, even to this day, consider him perhaps the, the, the greatest halachic authority of certainly, you know, the last 30, 40, 50 years. He was, he was Nifter in 1955. He said that he believed that a, um, he believed that a, an Amma was 58 centimeter, which would be 22.6 inches. 
The real question is how he ever derived that, and is there any way to authenticate what he said? Well, Hipponos Gate, or what we call what we call uh, Barclays Gate, may hold uh, the answer to that, because uh, as we mentioned in an earlier class, last one I believe, um, the Barclay was a uh, actually he was uh, both a clergyman and an ambassador. And he was the first person to recognize that it appears that 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 uh, um, there, that there's a lintel uh, right on the women's section. I'm going to see if I can get it back for you now, just for a second. It should be here quickly. I hope if I didn't mess this up. Uh, yeah, right there. This is um, this is right on the corner of where the the women's section is. This is a two meter high lintel, which extends in across the wall here. Actually, there's a little mosque there. And here's where the opening was. It was determined that this, are you ready for this? This lintel was, is um, 575 centimeters. Divide that by 10. And that's 57.5 centimeters. So uh, that would be one amma, would be 50, according to this. And again, we have to first assume that this is a Kiponus gate. Can't prove that. Um, but if it is, and if it is, as the Mishnah says, that each of the, uh, of the entrances to Harbait was 10 amot wide, and this is 57, 575 centi uh, centimeters, uh, then this would be, um, this would be, a, if you divide by 10, 57.5. That's about as close as you can get, maybe, maybe a quarter of an inch uh, to what an ama is. So how he did it is beyond me, but uh, he did. Now let's see here, let's get ourselves back to where we were. Sorry. Here we go. Now, um, this is, uh, many of you may have seen this in sukkahs, this particular uh, portrait or this particular uh, image that um, is here. And a lot of people don't realize exactly what they're looking at. So this would be a good opportunity for us to talk about what the Gemara talks about, but also um, uh, it has significance for us even today. These people are standing on Haraz 18. So we're east of Harabait. And uh, here, this is a, an image of the, uh, I have to get this up because you can't see it. There we go. This is the Paraduma, which is here. And this is the, the ritual of the slaughtering of the Paraduma and the, and the ashes of the red heifer. And those ashes, let each, each red heifer, there were 10 uh, until the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash. So each of them lasted many years. The whole idea of the Paraduma is to, especially around the time of the Korban Pesach, to allow people to be able to bring the Korban Pesach when they were Tahor. Now, um, a number of, this is a very nice image because it brings into to light numerous halachic issues. Number one, what you're looking at down here, what you're looking at down here, that would be the Kidron Valley, or what we call Nachal Kidron, it has two other names too. It's called uh, Emek Yehoshaphat, uh, the, the Valley of the Judgment of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's also called Emek HaMelech for various different reasons. Um, so, but here the problem was there was, there was uh, what, there is a halachic situation down here of what is called Tumat to home. That there are bodies down there, but we don't know where they are. Because that's the case, Kohanim, cannot just go down into, into that valley. What the halachic implications are now for Kohanim, that I, I can't get into. Certainly there are people far more well-versed than I to talk about the actual halachic implications. But this is why there was this bridge, a rather intricate bridge that was built. It was, it's called the Kevesh Hapara. Kevesh Hapara was the way that people, that's how people got from Yerushalayim uh, inside and all the way over to Har, Har Azetim 
without actually going into the valley. And the whole idea is the construction of this kevesh, the construction of this particular bridge was such that it would stop, it would create a chatzitza of tumma, that there would not be, tumma could not rise up to these koan in here. They weren't allowed to extend their arms out over, uh, over, the, uh, over the nachal. Uh, there were a lot of issues. As a matter of fact, the Gemara in Shkolem tells us that there were three of these, three different koanim gedolim <laughs> built it, uh, built one, and each one was dissatisfied with the way it was done earlier. So I don't know which one this one actually, I don't think anybody knows, uh, portrays, and maybe, it, maybe it's not authentic for any of them, but this is the idea of an actual historical event. Now here, take a look here, you can see uh, a gate. That would be right around where uh, Shah HaRachamim is today. And Chazal tell us that the, that the Shechina exited Shah HaRachamim when the destroyed, Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, and that um, uh, the Shechina will, will re-enter through that gate. And we talked about why Shah Rachamim is closed in earlier discussions. Um, the purpose here was for the Kohen to be able to look in through the gate and get in to see, um, into, into the, uh, to the Heichal of the Beit HaMikdash. That's what that, and that, thereby fulfilling the mitzvah of Lifnei Hashem. Before Hashem, everything's before Hashem, but that, that his eyes should be able to look and gaze on it and to see, um, uh, the, to see the Heichal. That's pretty much uh, this particular image. If there are any questions or anybody wants to add some comments, please feel free. If so, we're going to go on to a, uh, a very um, interesting um, piece of history that and it's called Burnt House. Some of you, I would imagine, have been to Burnt House. Many times. Many times. Who said many times? Oh, Joel? Yeah. Yeah, good. Right, many times. Um, and I've been there also a few times. Um, Burnt House was a, almost an accidental discovery. And the reason is because you can look, if you know Nehemiah built a wall, if you know the Cardo existed, then you can look for the Cardo, and you can look for a, uh, you know, you can look for the, the wide wall, which we've talked about earlier. But here you have a house that has been lying dormant underground for 20 centuries, 2,000 years, 19 centuries at least. Um, and uh, as we've mentioned in the past, uh, the, uh, it was decided uh, after uh, we removed the, uh, the occupational forces of the Jordanians from Yerushalayim. Our soldiers did that uh, in 1967. The question was, do we build or do we go underground and see what was here? Um, they made a very wise decision that building would be limited in the Jewish quarter um, and, uh, and archeological digging would, would occupy most of the first decade after the, uh, the liberation of Yerushalayim. And one of the, you'd have to say it's an accidental discovery. Was that uh, a, 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 the remains of a building that we now call Burnt House? Josephus, in, uh, uh, in describing what Yerushalayim uh, went through prior to and following the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, mentions that the Romans were not done uh, with their destructive uh, behavior uh, when the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. They didn't consider the, um, the, the deed being done, mission accomplished. And for nearly a month, they, they besieged the rest of the city, what we call the upper city. Remember, um, the western part of Yerushalayim is higher than the eastern part of Yerushalayim, and therefore it's called the upper city. And that's what we're looking at now. It's called the upper city. Um, and uh, uh, he, he records... That the, that the buildings were ultimately destroyed and conquest of the city was completed on the eighth day of Elul, a week and a day hence from today. First of all, Chodesh Tov to everybody. A week and a day hence, that was the day that the Romans uh, 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 actually destroyed the rest of the city, including this building. Now, uh, we know archaeologists uh, uh, 
need to know a lot of halacha. Whether or not they follow it, that depends on the archaeologist, but they need to know it. And that means they have to know Mishnayot very, very well. And, and Gemara too, as we'll see. Um, the, uh, they know that Kohanim lived in this house because almost everything is stoneware. Stone does not become tame. And so therefore, uh, the tables, uh, I guess the eating ware, whatever that, that they found was all stone <clears throat> and therefore not metal. And, uh, and therefore, uh, they concluded that Kohanim lived here. And not only that, they concluded that Kohanim lived in Burnt House because uh, of the, the, uh, was, there was a mikveh there that was not at all uncommon. In the, in the houses of the upper city where Kohanim lived and wealthy people, um, there were many mikvahot and one could understand that it was not uncommon for them to go to Harbit uh, several times during a month and if Kohanim had responsibilities there, they would go every day. So, but before they go on hard bite, they would go to the mikvah in their house. And so many mikvahs had, a house, had, had uh, houses. Uh, they had, of course, heaters. No, they didn't have them. I think they just put that in there now and electrical plugs. But uh, nevertheless, um, it, um, the house itself is wonderful to see. Hi. Yes. Somebody ask a question? Oh, okay. Um, the, many of the houses also had escapeways because uh, they knew that the Romans were coming and they wanted to be able to escape. Now, we know that the name of the people who lived in this house was Katros. It's, as a matter of fact, one of the names of it is not just a Bait Asaruf, but it's also Beit Katros, Katros. Now, the Gemara in, in Psachim talks about the fact that Kohanim um, very often were to be held accountable for things that they did wrong. And one of the things that Katros did was they wrote various inappropriate letters uh, revealing certain things, saying certain things. We don't know exactly what was in them. The Gemara tells us it's for the letters that they wrote that uh, their, their house was destroyed. Now, it's interesting that this very house has within it um, met weights with the name Katros on it. So they had weights in the house, and this, uh, um, it, it had Katros in it. Is it possible that there were other Kohanim and uh, they loaned him the, the, uh, the weights? Yeah, that's, that's certainly possible. But it's much, much more likely that the very family that the Gemara mentions Gemara Sacha mentions um, is the, the very family that, that uh, lived in this house and, as we will see, died in this house. This, um, while they were doing their excavation, they, they saw, they came across this arm of a young woman or girl, either an adolescent uh, or, or a young woman, uh, with, there you can see the hand, um, it's, it is almost, you know, it is so remarkable and painful. For 2,000 years, she lay there under the ground uh, without, uh, you know, without a proper burial, waiting, though, for, the, for that wonderful moment when uh, our, our forces would liberate Yerushalayim forever. Uh, and, of course, as soon as the, uh, th those who were doing the excavations found this arm and, uh, and, the, and the, the appendage, uh, they of course brought it for proper burial. So it's certainly not there now, uh, but that's, they took a picture, which they should, because it reminds us of the horror of what, uh, what the J Jews went through um, as the Romans went apparently house to house in order to track them down and burn them, kill them and to, uh, um, to rape and to plunder. Um, I included this little, uh, this uh, slide. Uh, the 10th Legion of the Romans were, were uh, encamped in Yerushalayim, particularly after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Um, and uh, eventually the city would be named Lea Capitolina. We'll get to that a little bit later. But we, this, uh, this patch here, um, is, a, uh, is a remnant of uh, the 10th Legion. X, of course, is 
would be 10. And we're going to skip over that for a, for a moment or two. And, and there we go. I want to uh, do two things if we can. Let's see how much time we have. Yes, we'd certainly have time. Um, let's get to Elio, Elio Capitolino. The thing to make this was the story in the year 70 CE. Um, and uh, hey, and and uh, and uh, Jews did not live there. They lived only very, very sparsely there. But in the year of um, roughly the year 130, um, Hadrian, 60 years later, Hadrian, the emperor, the new emperor of uh, Rome, uh, made a mistake. He alluded to the fact that maybe they could build the Beit Hamikdash again. And there is nothing worse than disappointment. It would have been better had he said nothing. And then he changed his mind anyway. And that was the beginning in the year 132 to 135 of the, uh, of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, as most revolts, as most wars, there's more than one contributing factor. Um, but uh, the Jews, many Jews, of course, believed that 70 years after the destruction of the first, uh, the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash, and there was a 70 year lapse between the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash and the building of the second. So many Jews took that as a, um, as a harbinger that in fact, the, the Beit HaMikdash would be rebuilt. Um, and when uh, Hadrian pulled the rug out from under them, um, a tremendous amount of frustration and anger was unleashed and uh, the uh, the Roman and the uh, the third revolt, the third revolt, uh, the revolt of Bar Kokhba began. Uh, are there questions? No. no? Okay. Um, now here you're looking at a, and of course it was crushed. Here you are looking at um, an image of what Yerushalayim looked like after the destruction of the first of the second Beit Hamikdash and after the Bar Kokhba revolts. Now, if you recall, um, th the city was almost two and a half times the size uh, before the revolt and, be and before the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. But now in the year 140 CE, five years after the destruction of the uh, Bar, Koch Bar Kokhba and, and, the d and the dreams that were with it, and of course, Eve uh, Harrow uh, took us through uh, the Herod Herodion and uh, and uh, the fact that it was used uh, both in in the year in the year seventy and in the year one thirty two to one thirty five as somewhat of a headquarters for the Jewish rebels. Um, uh, Herod, Herod, of course, had been gone for many many years. He died in four BCE. But um, now we look at Yushalayim uh, as it was in about the year one forty. Now. There were, there were several Hadrianic decrees that took place. He wanted to make sure that the Jews knew once and for all that, uh, that all revolts were futile and that Rome would dominate them. So the first thing he did was uh, he built a temple to Jupiter, which was w one of two or three primary um, Roman deities. Um, and he built it, of course, right on Harabite, right on the Makom Amikdash. And that was this was, the, this was obviously before the Christians, the Christ, uh, Christians took over Rome. Oh yes, this is 150 years before that. At least, yeah, okay. Right, as we're going to get there, we we will see that 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 Rome became. I don't even know whether we could say the Christians took over Rome. What happened? Yeah. What, converted itself, it converted from paganism to Christianity. Uh, we'll get there, but yeah, thank you. Um, now, uh, that's not one. The second thing he did is he, Chazal tell us that he lowered Harabait of an Amut. Well, it's unlikely that Chazal intend to be taken literally. Seriously, absolutely. Literally, probably not. Um, Chazal were, were given, not at all a failing, but you have to understand that when Chazal talk about magnificent things, whether for good or for bad, uh, oftentimes they used uh, attention getters. And the very thought of lowering Harabai to 1,000 amo, which would be the effect of 3,000 feet, 
um, uh, is 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 what uh, many many reformers say is a guzma. It's not the only guzma that that they give, but if we keep it in in that perspective, then um, then uh, we'll understand. I know, for example, my sister Aleh Shalom used to say, "I've said a million times." Well, I soon learned that a million is probably not the number of times that she said it. We all are given to some sort of guzma ot at one point or another. But Chazal, they say that uh, it was lowered. Certainly, it was plowed. And certainly nothing was up there but the Temple of Jupiter. Also, Jews, uh, males, were not permitted to be in Yerushalayim. Any circumcised Jew, first of all, there were to be no, uh, there were to be no circumcisions. Chanzal talk about the fact that during this period of time, that's precisely when Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was born. So, um, um, nevertheless, it was a very, very uh, dark, painful time in Yerushalayim. And the name of Yerushalayim was changed to Ilya Capital. That was, as a matter of fact, the, probably the most, uh, the most egregious uh, insult of all, that Yerushalayim, ir, you know, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, uh, should be called Ilya Capitolina. Uh, Ilya Capitolina, Ilya is the family of, of Hadrian. Capitolina is the capital. They were not allowed to call it Yerushalayim. The 10th army, the 10th legion, was kept right here, in this quarter right here. Just to give you a little perspective, this is where um, Shar Yafo is today, where we enter. This is the um, this is uh, the citadel, Herod's citadel. Again, he's dead, but he still he still bears his name. He was a great builder. Uh, this is called this is the Cardo, and this is called this is called the Valley Cardo right here. Um, and not that we know, I'm um, sorry, there we go. Um, we don't know all the streets, but we do know that, uh, that the Romans generally uh, insisted on having one, two central st uh, streets which, uh, which uh, intersected here and here. That made it easier for them to govern. Okay. And this is called the Western Hill. Remember, there, uh, as, as was pointed out earlier, there were Christians here. No question there were Christians, but um, they, they were relatively few. And Judaism uh, and, the, and the Chachamim, of course, uh, in various different ways, um, separated them from us, even through part of our Tfilo. We're now actually coming to uh, the Byzantine period. The, uh, the period of Ilya Capitolina started in 140. The Mishnah, is, we attribute the Mishnah to the year roughly 180. Um, and then uh, uh, another, uh, uh, another 125 or 30 years later, we see the beginning of the Byzantine period. Now, let's talk a little bit of what the Byzantine period is. Um, Rome was on the, on the decline by the year 325 CE. Uh, we actually could not complete the, the Talmud Yerushalmi. We couldn't complete the Jerusalem Talmud it actually just sort of withered away. Uh, and so the, by 325 or 350, uh, it, was, it was incomplete but finished. Um, and the emperor was Constantine. Constantine believed, uh, the legend is, legend is that he believed uh, through a dream that, uh, he, that he, would, he would conquer through a belief in Jesus and Christianity. So uh, he had a dream, and this you shall conquer. In fact, it was in, right before a major battle, and this made him and his mother convert uh, to Christianity and to therefore make Christianity the officially recognized of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Questions? Oh, okay. um, uh, now, Rome, until then, had been a pagan um, a pagan uh, uh, empire, and uh, and the Jews were a recognized religion. Uh, paganism did not always exclude uh, Jews because of their religion. I would imagine the average Roman wa uh, despised the Jews not because of their religion, but because they were nudniks in their eyes. That in fact Jews, uh, uh, you know, were quite willing to fight uh, for what they believed in. But it wasn't necessarily 
uh, that they were anti, that the Romans were anti-Semitic in terms of wanting to crush Judaism, uh, but they were perfectly happy to crush Jews. Now that di dichotomy could be debated, uh, but that's basically how it was. Now in, in 325, when Christianity became the recognized religion of, um, of Rome, that's when the character of Yushalayim was drastically changed. If you recall, we said right here, um, Hadri built the temple to Jupiter, right on the Harabite, right on the Makomabite, right on the place of the, of the Beit HaMikdash. Well, as soon as Christianity became the dominant religion uh, of Rome, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the monument to, um, to Jupiter was removed, the temple to Jupiter was removed, and in its place, a major church was placed on Harabite, once again, on Harabite. Uh, there were other such Roman uh, pagan symbols that were removed, and they were literally replaced with Christian artifacts and Christian um, uh, sacred buildings. One of those sacred buildings is this one right here. There was a, uh, uh, a temple to, um, uh, uh, there, there was a, a temple that was built um, in honor again of, uh, uh, of a Roman, Roman goddess and uh, Aphrodite. And uh, when in 325, when Rome became Christianized, that was torn down. And we have here uh, on this place, uh, the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which to this day is considered to be um, the place where, uh, where Jesus died and, and rose in Christian legend. Now, this particular picture um, is instructive for us because uh, it embodies some of the, uh, the, the places that we've learned about already, plus uh, the Byzantine aspect of uh, Yerushalayim. Unfortunately, the next two or three sessions that we're going to have uh, will deal with um, not Jewish uh, Jerusalem, but rather um, of the Christians and, and of the Arabs as well, and the Ottomans. Now, this picture is standing, I took this picture, it's standing, we're standing on the, the Faisal Tower, Migdal Patsael, um, in, uh, in the, uh, the uh, citadel, which is, you can see what, right when you enter, um, when you enter Sharyafo. Now, in this picture, there are a number of things that we should know. Number one, this is the Christian quarter, right here. The Northwest quarter is Christian corner, quarter, and that will include actually this up till here. Now, it, the quarter ends because there is a valley and a street. Those of you who've taken the direct route to the Kotel and you go straight down into the Shuk, you're actually entering what is called the, uh, the transversal valley that goes east to west. And you can feel that you're going down, down, down till you get, till you get to the Tyropian Valley, which, which goes from north to south, and then you're ready to go to Harabai. So this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right here. This is called the Church of, of the Ascension, also uh, a, central, um, a central building uh, in, in Christian thinking. And this is Haratzophim here, and this is, uh, this is Hebrew University. This, I would urge you, if you can, to go into, uh, into Herod's castle or the citadel, whatever we call it, right? Or just as you enter Sharyafo, and then climb this tower. It's probably about 70 or 80 steps. But you get the most magnificent view of Yushalayim. Uh, this is the Temple of Aphrodite that I was talking about. That's the image of it, uh, and in its place, uh, the Christians immediately built uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Here again is another image of that church. Also in this picture is an interesting uh, structure. It's, it's actually built on the, along the lines of, uh, 
the, of Roman uh, urbanization. This was called the Forum. And uh, just as if you, as you may recall, we said that the, the Greeks had something called, uh, something was, um, that was called an agora, uh, which means an open marketplace. Well, another ancient people had it also, but they called it the Roman Forum. And that's also in the Christian Quarter. I spend very little time in the Christian Quarter, so I can't answer many questions on it. Um, this map is absolutely essential for us to understand the intersection of history, archaeology, religion, all, uh, all, all together. Uh, in the Torah, in Parsha Bamidbar, the Torah tells us that when the Jews are about to enter Eretz Israel, uh, we are told that they went ad nofach, asher ad medava, medava. Uh, it, it seems to have, for us, relatively little significance. There's not a lot of meforshim on it. There's not a lot of, of discussion on it, except that the Torah is telling us this was the route that the Jews went on. But what's interesting is that this town, Medva, is has its parallel right on the same place in the Arab town in Jordan called Medaba. Now, about 150 years ago, a map was discovered on the floor, a mosaic map was discovered on the floor of a church in Medaba, which is Medaba. And if you look at it, the people who studied it realized this is the most accurate, if not accurate, at least the most significant portrayal of what Yerushalayim looked like in the sixth century. So what I want to do is um, sort of try to identify with you um, several places on this particular map. Some of you may well have seen it. Um, it is, it was made to scale. If you, if you go to the Cardo, and you, instead of looking at the pillars of the Cardo, you turn left and go to the, the pricey stores of the Cardo, you'll see there, this map is hanging on a wall and it is pretty much, um, uh, it's a mosaic, uh, pretty much to scale. It's much, it's quite big, quite big. Let's look and see what its features are. First of all, maps, and in this case, this is a form of a map in the ancient world placed north on the, on the left side of, of the uh, map. So this is north, this is south, this is east, and this is west. Once the, uh, the archeologists understood this and the historians, they now could look and see what is portrayed here. First of all, it makes perfect sense. This is Shar Shem. Shar Shem is the, the most uh, elaborate of all the gates. Uh, it is even to this day, it is, it is uh, very busy, but of course it, it's found primarily in the Muslim quarter, uh, not in, in, inside and also outside, in Sheikh Jarrah and the, the, the neighborhoods, uh, the, uh, the Arab neighborhoods that are there. Uh, notice here also there is what it looks like a rook in a chess game. This is a pillar. Hadrian, let's go back to Hadrian for a moment. If you recall, Hadrian, of course, plowed Yerushalayim with salt. He defeated uh, Bar Kochva's forces. He then, then uh, uh, lowered the Har Harabite, humiliated the Jewish people with a, with a pagan uh, image and temple on Harabite, on the Makom HaMikdash. Now, he was very proud of himself. So he did what very often was done. Romans either uh, to to either to memorialize their conquests, that what, did they would, what they would do was either to build, a, um, uh, to build an arch or a big pillar. Now, I don't know whether any of you got a chance to see on Tisha B'Av, on Tisha B'Av there was uh, the Israeli ambassador to Rome, to Italy, uh, gave his course uh, at, at, at the base of the Arch of Titus, such a magnificent idea on Tisha B'Av to, to do that. Of course, we saw those images 
Um, so that was one humiliation of the Jewish people. And this uh, pillar was built by Hadrian, placed at the most um, trafficked area of Yerushalayim uh, to get in and to get out. And it's, it, it was a pillar in honor of Hadrian. As a matter of fact, the Arabs called this gate, we call it, uh, we call it the Damascus Gate or Shar Shechem. They call it Bab Alamud. Bab is a gate like Baba Kamba, Baba Mitzia, Baba Batra. Amud is a pillar. Even though it isn't here anymore, that name stuck with it. And when, when the light rail, I, I hear, I, I've, I've not traveled the light rail much, but uh, when the light rail gets to this place, they, they say, Shar Shechem, Bab Alamud. So, uh, so this led them to realize they knew that this pillar was up. It didn't exist then, but they realized this is north. Then they realized this domed structure would be the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Sorry. Uh, would be the church of the Holy Sepulchre. There we go. Yeah. Um, right here. And if this is the western gate, this is the eastern gate, this is Harabite. Notice there seems to be a lot of, um, a lot of buildings on Harabite. Remember, this is in the sixth century, the 500s. So these are all Christian structures on Harabite. One other thing that we should note here is this long white line and this line they realized that, that the Romans in many cities, not just in Yerushalayim, they created certain streets that would go all the way across. They recognized this as a street. They recognized these as pillars. They recognized this as also called the Cardo. Most people seem to say the Cardo means the heart of the city, although not everybody agrees. I don't know enough to agree or disagree. But uh, this is the Cardo, and this is the Valley Cardo. And if you look, this is the artist's conception of what the Cardo must have looked like. See all of the pillars here. Here you have the pillars on both sides. Now, it was underground. It lay underground for certainly a thousand years. Um, and then it was uncovered through the archaeology and uh, you have this. Uh, when you go down and, and you're walking to, to Harabait and you're walking to go to the Kotel, uh, on your right, as you're going down the stairs, you'll see these pillars. They were not found like this, of course, but uh, these pillars are represented here in the Madaba map. Now, here you have stores. They obviously had some degree of zoning in those days. Um, so that the stores would be, again, pretty much competitive, and uh, they would sell their wares on the Cardo. And this is why the Cardo has its name. And of course, behind where this, was, this picture was taken, uh, you have what they call the upscale Cardo. Uh, and the, and that, re that is represented both in terms of uh, Byzantine Jerusalem and also Crusader Jerusalem. There's a close-up of, uh, and there's, you can see all the stores uh, conform to pretty much the same zoning plan. Next week, Amir Tishem, we're going to start the early Arab period. Uh, again, we can see how the, uh, this is the general outline of the old city. At times, it did extend south here. We do have remnants of this wall, but not very much. So just to orient you again, and then we'll stop. This is the, this is uh, uh, the Nachal uh, Kidron. This is the Transversal Valley. This is the Ben Hinnom Valley. Here's the uh, Shiloach Pond, the Ir David, and the Ophel and Arabai. And there's the Cardo, and there's the, there's the Valley Cardo. Well, everybody, uh, we'll wish you a, a, a good week, Emir Tzashem. We'll look back. Uh, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you next week where we'll discuss the Arab period and the Ottoman period. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye, guys. Yes, good to see you. Like I told everybody, all the best. Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov.